Thank you, Lydia. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your, your word, Lord. We thank you for the, the words we've read today. Uh, we thank you for those who have uh, preserved them over the centuries, Lord. Some, some have died that we have it in our own languages. And Father God, we just pray today that you'll speak to us through your spirit. You'll open these, uh, these verses, this book of James to us. And we just pray that we'll be blessed by this series, that we'll know you more in your name. There was a guy who uh, came to see his, his minister saying he was in a real sort of spiritual slump. Uh, he couldn't get enthusiastic about anything to do with church, to do with God, uh, and just was in a real wasteland. So the minister said to him, what I want you to do is pray for a month. Very simple pray, Lord, show me myself and then come back and see me. The man came back a month later, even worse off, feeling even more wretched, even more hopeless after praying this prayer. He said, what do I do? I feel even more, even worse. This is terrible. The minister said, I wanted to pray this prayer for a month. Lord, show me yourself. The man went and prayed, Lord, show me yourself. Came back a month later, full of enthusiasm, full of joy, full of blessing, full of hope. Knowing God is so important. We're taught a lot in today's age about understanding yourself. Knowing yourself, knowing your strengths and weaknesses. Loving yourself. We're not told so much are we, about loving God, about knowing God. Well, we're starting a new series today. Uh, we, I think it's got that. There you go. James, Thinking Right About God. That's not me, James. That's the book, James. Uh, we started a new series. I must admit, when I looked at the rotor, I thought, why am I preaching four weeks on the trot? Uh, thankfully, that was just the, the book. So we're starting the book of James today. Uh, James was the, the brother, or half-brother, uh, same, same mother, very different father to Jesus. Uh, so this is not the James who was one of the first disciples of Jesus. So this wasn't the James who was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, this was another James who came a little bit later. Uh, he's briefly mentioned in the Gospels, but comes to prominence uh, really after um, most of the events of the Gospels. He was obviously very familiar with the teachings of Jesus. Uh, he references a lot of things Jesus taught. And it seems in the early church he was quite a prominent uh, person. I don't think he was prominent because of who he was. You notice he doesn't say James the brother of Jesus, because that's, that's quite a claim. He just says, James, a servant of God. So he's very well respected, it seems. Uh, his words have been preserved over 2,000 years. Very direct, very to the point. Sometimes seems a little bit grumpy. I like a little bit of grumpiness. Very to the point, no messing around. And there's a lot of call to action in these words. James really covers the, the balance between works and grace quite comprehensively, I would say. But some have taken the words too far. Some, there are some churches that are known to us. Uh, some of you have come from those churches where they really preach a salvation through works gospel. If you do A, B and C, which often involves giving a certain amount of money to that church, then you will be saved. And they will take verses from James somewhat out of context and say, there you go, you must do these things to be saved. Still others have rejected James, the book of James completely. They said it's too much about works. It's at odds with the rest of the Bible. Now I'll save a more detailed uh, dive into this for someone else, but we believe that James is the inspired word of God and that it's not at odds with the rest of Scripture. Nothing in James contradicts other parts of the Bible. In fact, it complements, it just has a slightly different emphasis. We believe we are saved through grace to do good works, not that we are saved through works. In short, James teaches the importance of doing good things because we are saved, not to be saved. 
So I would highly recommend, as we start this series, read through the, the book of James. Uh, read through it in one game. James wrote this not as a kind of uh, encyclopedia of Christian doctrine. He wrote this as a letter, an open letter, it says to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, to the Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And this is relevant to us today as it was to them back then. And it can be very worth reading it all in one go. Sit down, maybe 10, 20 minutes, see how far you can get, maybe once a week. Read through the whole book, through the whole book. Ask God to open something to you. It's really good just to get a sense, get a flavour of the overall letter rather than individual bits. But anyway, just to mix things up, uh, we're covering this topic, uh, sorry, this book um, in four parts. So there are five chapters, uh, but there's so much in James to actually go and kind of go through verse by verse is quite a challenge. So we're going through in four parts. And today, as you see, we are looking at the theme of thinking right about God. So I'll be talking about a few things, quoting a few different verses from James. Uh, do have your own Bibles open. Uh, always good to check these things yourself. So I'm going to just pull out four Four things that James says about thinking right about God and how that maybe contrasts with a lot of the thinking we have today, whether in church or outside of church. First thing we see, God is a just God. God is a God of justice. James writes in, in James 4 verse 12, uh, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but is sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. Later on in chapter five, verse nine, he says, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. James is very clear on this. Jesus spoke about this a lot, the rest of the Bible, talks about this. God is a God of justice. God is a holy God who expects a certain standard that is extremely high. It goes very much against the thinking and, and sometimes even the priest that we can do whatever we like. If we know Jesus, well, we can do what we want. We don't have to change anything. Nothing should change in our lives because we know Christ. That completely misses the point of what Christ did for us. Christ died that we might be transformed. Our God is a God of justice. It talks in Romans, the wages of sin is death. God has a very, very high standard. God is a God of justice. And sometimes we don't like that because we think, well, he should just kind of let everyone off for everything. Because the world doesn't work like that, does it? We don't work like that. We have societies that are based on things that are wrong and things that are right. And as humans, we expect to see justice done. There's all kind of high profile trials going on at the moment, and I won't get into the detail of those. But sometimes we see something so clear, it's so obvious that justice must be done. God is no different. God is a God of justice. Then there are still others that will say, well, God, you know, one day this is right for God, and the next day it's another thing. Some major world religions teach just that, that God is a fickle God. That you can do everything he says you should do, but you get to their equivalent of judgment day, and it's kind of how he feels on the day. It's an arbitrary decision. James says, it's like another passage of scripture, God is unchanging. James 1 verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. The God we read about at times uncomfortably in the Old Testament, the harsh God meeting out justice on earth, that is the God we worship today. It can be very uncomfortable. Some people will try and reconcile it by saying, you know, these were written by different people. That actually the New Testament 
is the inspired word of God. But the Old Testament is just myths and fairy tales and history handed down by you know, Bronze Age shepherds. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. This God of justice is unchanging. God is not fickle. God does not have a different standard today than he did yesterday. God does not demand less or more today than he did yesterday. Now if I stop there, this sermon would be a problem for us all. Because the standards of God are impossibly high, we cannot reach those. Technically there is one way to be right with God, there are, sorry, there are two ways to be right with God. And the first is to keep everything he has commanded, to obey him perfectly through your whole life. That's beyond all of us. It's beyond most of us just for a day, let alone a lifetime. But thankfully God is good. God is a good God. God is not an evil, capricious, changeable God who does things on a whim, who sometimes is good, but other times is bad. God is good. God is loving. God is, God is caring. A few verses in James where he, he talks about this. James 5, verse 11. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We have a compassionate God. We have a merciful God. I say we all want to see justice. But we need mercy, don't we? We need a merciful God. James says more about the goodness of God. James 1 verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. God gives generously. Verse 17 again, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. God is a good God. God is a loving God. God is a generous God. He's also a gracious God. Chapter 4, verse 6, but he gives us more grace. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Most importantly, God is a forgiving God. Chapter 5, verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. God is a healing God, God is a forgiving God. So as well as justice from God, we get mercy, and we get grace, and we get forgiveness. And it's so important we have these things in balance. This is where the book of James really tackles this head on. Because we have such a gracious, such a loving God, we can be encouraged. We can be challenged to do good, to do what is right, because we know we have such a loving God. There are some prominent thinkers or Famous people who really struggle with the idea of God being good because they look around. There are a lot of good things in the world. There are a lot of bad things as well. One of the more well known is uh, an English actor, Stephen Fry. Somebody once asked him, what would you say if you met God? Stephen Fry basically tells God off. He says he would say, how dare you? How dare you let children die? dare you let bad things happen when you can stop them. The great British naturalist David Attenborough, as he looked around nature, you'd have thought he would conclude, what an amazing creator. He concluded, if there is a God, he's terrible. Because animals eat each other. And people die and people live in poverty. And a lot of people really struggle to understand that God is good because they see bad things happening. And of course, God could stop it all. God could take away our free will, make us do only good things, stop all the bad things happening, and yet there'd be no bad things in the world. But we'd have no free will, we'd have no freedom. Because invariably, the things that are happening in the world are because humans do terrible things to one another. The various conflicts going on around the world, around the world and I'm not going to get into the details, but both, both sides would claim they have justice on their side. They are in the right. 
they're reclaiming land or they're getting payback or whatever. Everyone thinks they're in the right, but ultimately, humans will do terrible things to each other. And usually the innocent and the weak suffer. But God is good. God provides a way for his justice and his grace to be reconciled. He provides that way through Jesus Christ. He sent his own son. An aspect of him came to earth in human form. The brother of the author of this book came down. That God in his perfect holiness could have justice. And yet we could have grace at the same time. If you ever doubt that God is good, think of what he has done for you in eternity. Think of the place that is prepared for you if you know Christ is your saviour. Because there's nothing in us. We haven't done that. It's not through our good deeds and our good works that we've earned that. It's through his love. It's through his grace. It's through his compassion. God is a good God. The book of James talks about it. The rest of the scriptures talk about it. I think it's only our, our modern society and our minds that let us think otherwise. Because it's kind of it's, it's fashionable, isn't it, to knock things down, to talk down about things, and people love to, to question God or deny his existence, but God is a good God. God is a loving God. The final thing we'll look at today in thinking right about God. God is coming back. Steve mentioned it uh, before the final song. James talks about it here. It says in James 5, Verse 7 and 8, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. The Lord is coming back. And again, this is something completely contrary to what we're mainly told. Certainly in Sweden, the views we've kind of outgrown God. We don't really need him because we're a sophisticated nation. We've got much better things than God. We've got mobile bank ID, we've got taxes and beautiful lakes and all these wonderful things. We don't need God. We left him behind. That's just, that's just for stupid nations like the British and the Americans. We don't need God here. We've outgrown him. At some point, <laughs> Sweden and a lot of people in the world are going to get a real shock because the Lord is coming back. At some point, God is going to come back and make everything new. Some, some of the struggles we have with seeing God as a good, as a gracious, as a compassionate God is because we just think of our existence on this earth. And there are those who are struggling. Maybe you've had a good week, maybe you've had a bad week, maybe you've had a tough life. We think this, if this is all there is, how can God be good? Nobody's going to have a bad day in eternity if they know Jesus Christ as Saviour. If you spend eternity in heaven with Him, you're just going to have a lot of good days. You're going to have a lot of amazing days. The Lord is coming back. And those who know Him as Saviour will spend eternity with Him in heaven. Lord is coming back. So just to conclude, how can we think right about God? Because in these 20 or so minutes that I've kind of thrown a lot of things at you, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to remember. How can we be constantly refreshing our thoughts about God? Because there'll be plenty of things this week telling you otherwise. There'll be plenty of influences in the weeks and months Trying to pull you away from that view of God. Trying to tell you God doesn't exist. Trying to tell you that religion is just about control or about rules. How can we think rightly about God? First of all, look to Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus. Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John, For this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. No one comes to God except through me. He also said, if you knew me, you would know God. 
we look to Jesus, if we read about him in the Gospels, if we look to his teachings, that'll help us think right about God. Secondly, let's look into the Scriptures. Let's look into all of them. Let's look in the New Testament. Let's look in the Old Testament. Let's look at what God has said. Let's look at what God has done. Let's look for him in those verses. God is throughout Scripture. You can't miss him. Third thing, look to the creation. Look to this wonderful world in which we live. If you look for God, you'll find him constantly. His hand is in so many things. If you look for him, you will see. Psalmist writes, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Paul, when he wrote Romans, said God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. If we look at the beauty of his creation, if we look for God in that, we will see him. Our minds will be renewed, will be refreshed with this idea that we have a powerful, loving creator. But I think we actually know this. It says in the Bible, God's law is written on our hearts and our conscience bears witness. The Bible speaks that everyone deep down knows that there is a God. And sometimes we spend a lot of time and effort to ignore that. We spend a lot of energy and a lot of effort trying to deny that. But even some of the most prominent anti-Christian speakers, they will admit they're not sure. Maybe there is God. At times they've called out. Because deep down we all have a sense of God. We are his creation. We are made in his image. So sometimes we just need to listen to our conscience. We need to listen to our own hearts. So we know God exists. We know what he's done for us. So look to Jesus, look to scripture, look to creation, look to our own hearts and pray to him. Maybe not as drastically as that, that poor guy who prayed, show me myself and then show me yourself for 30 days. But pray to God that he will show you himself. Pray that you'll see him in every day. Pray that he'll speak to you through the scriptures. Because thinking right about, thinking right about God is just so important in our daily lives. If we think right about God, we can trust in his goodness. We can have assurance in his promises. We can be assured that we'll spend eternity with him if we're trusting in him and him alone. We can live in his grace. We can live lives that he wants us to live. If we think right about God, we'll be encouraged to do good things, to join the street evangelism team. Notice not once did they say, come along street evangelism, because otherwise you might not be saved. I'm very glad they didn't. <laughs> Because we don't believe that. We believe things like that are good to do because we know Christ. And if you have a right thought about God, you will want to do things for him in service of him, in service of one another. And come to him in prayer. Come to him as your loving, heavenly father. God is not a far off, distant, unapproachable God. There used to be two so back in ancient times, there used to be two kind of main views of what gods were. There was one type of god that was kind of huge and uncaring and terrifying, kind of like your Zeusers and your, you know, people throwing lightning bolts around. And then they had another concept of god that was kind of like a local god, like a god of the hills or a god of the mountains, a god of the valleys. When David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. That's a combination of both. The Lord is a powerful, mighty, unchangeable, eternal being. But he's my shepherd. He's your shepherd. He knows you by name. He knows everything about you. He cares for you. Come to that Lord in prayer. 
trust in him, live in his graces. I really urge you this week, just take some time thinking about how you can how you can know God more. Not academically, but in your heart. How can you get to know him more as you would know a loving father on this earth? There's so much about him in the scriptures. So much about him in creation. I urge you to find him, seek him, and follow him. Amen. Steve, you got another, another tune? If you do want to talk about any of these things afterwards, do feel free to, to grab me or, or talk to Steve. But um, yeah. Please.